So we're still in First Peter, and we will be for a while, I think. First Peter, uh, chapter one, verses seventeen through to verse twenty-one today. The last time, last week, we were looking um, at our salvation. We were considering our salvation from the point of view that our salvation is a call to be holy in an unholy world, to be holy in an unholy world, that the believer is called to be separate from the world's ways and the world's systems. And this separation, this holiness, is a reflection of the separate and holy God to whom we belong, he says in verse 16, be ye holy, for I am holy. Today we're going to be looking at salvation um, from another uh, angle, a different aspect of our salvation. Um, I hope you enjoy your salvation. I really do hope you enjoy being a saved individual. But one of the things that we uh, find regarding our salvation is that it's not simply a call to holiness in an unholy world, but it's a call to reverence in an irreverent world. We live in a world today that couldn't care less about anything other than itself. But we live as believers, and our first priority is God. Our first priority is to glorify God. So the title of the message today is called to reverence in an irreverent world. In verse 17, uh, the apostle Peter uses a word, we've just been singing about it, um, that we are no longer slaves to fear. Peter uses a word at the very, that very word at the end of verse 17. Let's read the verse. He says, if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass your time of sojourning here in fear. When this word is used of unbelievers before God, it means real fear. It means to be deeply afraid. An unholy person standing before a holy God shouldn't be casual about thoughts of God or themselves, they should fear Almighty God. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 30, Luke 24, 30, and it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? That's the experience of believers whose eyes are open to see Christ in their midst. It's a wonderful thing. Our hearts burn within us. But when an unbeliever is given sight of Almighty God, this is not their experience. It should not be the first experience of an unbeliever when they see God before them to rejoice. An unbeliever should tremble at the sight of a holy God. When they're made aware of God before them, that should be their response. However, when believers are described as standing um, before God 
in fear. It doesn't mean that. Hallelujah. When you and I stand before Almighty God as his children, we don't fear him, but we reverence him. We hold him in high and holy esteem. When we stand before God, and this is what Peter is speaking about here, because Peter speaking to believers, he means this reverence. In Ephesians 5 and verse 33, the same word, the same word or root word is used and it is translated as reverence. So Peter, writing to the elect, is saying to God's own that it is right for us to live our lives in fear, in reverence of who God is. Child of God, you do not need to tremble in abject fear before your Father in heaven. Please, it's reverence. We bow in humble respect to our God. We worship him, but we do not fear him as the world should fear him. We shouldn't fear him as the world. How ridiculous does it sound? For a child of God to tremble in that way before God Almighty, their Father, in the same way that someone who has rejected God all of their lives should tremble before him. Doesn't even make sense. We are no longer slaves to fear. For we are the children of God. I don't know about you, but for years, I beat myself up because I was made to feel that God was waiting to slap me down, even as a Christian. Praise the Lord. Praise Almighty God. He is not waiting to slap us down. No. Praise the Lord. Oh, Father, we worship you. We love you. We absolutely adore you. That we are no longer slaves to fear. So let's look at this passage in which the reason I bring the fear um, point up is because Peter speaks of God, our Father, as God, our judge, as God, our Redeemer, and as God, the source of our salvation. So when we think of God, our judge, Perhaps fear is something that we think about. Well, Peter says that God is the judge of his people. He's impartial. He's incorruptible. If you call on the Father, verse 17, <clears throat> who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work. That being true, says Peter, you have to live in reverence before God. Now, bear with me while we do this bit. You see, the day is coming when judgment will be handed down. Judgment will be dispensed from the great white 
throne of God. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, the dead and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged according to their works, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So judgment is coming. One of the things that really was interesting or intriguing to me a few weeks ago, um, without being uh, political about anything. A few weeks ago, the First Minister stood up when all of this gender recognition thing was at its height and being debated in Parliament, and she stood up and she said, I will be held to account for my decisions. She was meaning by the people of the country that if they don't agree with her, they'll get her, get her out. But isn't it true that she will give an account of her decisions before the great white throne? In fact, she won't need to because it's all written down in the books. And that's not a go at her particularly. That's just an illustration of the world's position. So here we are, judgment is coming. But believers will not be judged at the great white throne. Hallelujah. The books will be opened. And the book of life will be opened. We will not be condemned. Hallelujah. The world will be, but we won't be. We will not be judged there. A separation from those who have been disobedient to the gospel but we will not be judged. You see, those who have been disobedient to the gospel, we read in that Revelation passage, will be thrown into the lake of fire. But without rejoicing over someone else's demise, we can say today with all joy in our hearts that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life and we will not be amongst that number. We have already been translated into the kingdom of glory. We have already moved or been moved from death into life. Hallelujah. God has, has taken us drawn us to Jesus, and through Jesus we have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, from the kingdom of death into the kingdom of life. Oh, hallelujah. We are no longer slaves to fear, but we reverence our God. 
we will not be judged. However, Peter is writing to believers. He's writing to the elect scattered through these different regions. And he is saying that God is the judge of his people. We will not be judged and condemned at the great white throne, but we will be judged. So what does Peter mean if he doesn't mean the judgment at the great white throne of God, this white throne speaking of the purity of God and of his judgments? What does Peter mean that God is our judge and that we should therefore walk in reverence before him? Well, the apostle Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians, let Paul speak to us about it. Because you see, when we think of judgment, we think of oh, the, the terror of judgment. Not for us. Oh, I want you to be encouraged this morning when we read of God as our judge. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10. Paul has been talking about ministering. He said, according to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yet so is by fire. Oh, these are important words. Paul is saying that the day is coming when we will be judged by God with a view to reward. Hallelujah. Do you know that? When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, which is different from the white thro great white throne, when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Christian, your work will be judged the way you've lived and served as a Christian will be judged with a view to your reward for how well you've done. That's the judgment we face. It's the judgment into victory. Oh, that thrills me. My goodness, that thrills me. I'm not going to be condemned ever. But my work will be tested. And if it survives the fire, my reward will be given. When I say me, my, you, you, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ and our work is consumed by the fire, we'll maybe suffer that disappointment but we'll be ushered into glory. Hallelujah. And when we get into glory, no matter what our reward has been, we will be utterly satisfied with what God has given us, and we will live forever rejoicing in the victory that Jesus Christ has won for us. Isn't that marvelous? 
Oh, don't sit there, Christian, thinking the day will come when God will give you the belt. If you can still remember that. I remember the bad boys getting the belt in my school. I can't say more than that because my dad's sitting there and he's staring straight, staring straight at me. You're not going to get the belt or the cane or whatever it is. You're not going to get anything like that from God. God is not going to deal with you like that. Why? Because God has dealt with Christ. All of that has been placed on Jesus. How unjust would God be to then have his children stand before him as a judge and punish them as well? When Christ has borne all of my sin, all of my error, all of my mistakes, past, present, future, which means all my mistakes in serving God, for which I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. All the mistakes I've made will be reckoned up and reward will be given. Praise the Lord. What a blessed people we are. God is our judge, but it's judgment unto victory. And so I want to say to the Christians that are maybe listening, watching, listening, or in the church this morning, you might be one of these people that like to beat yourself up over what you've done and how you've hurt the Lord. Well, don't. Deal with it with the Lord. Come to God. Deal with your mistakes. Deal with your error. But don't you ever feel that the day will come when he will give you punishment for your mistakes. I'm so thankful to that. You see, I look back in my life and I can see them. I don't need to look too far and I see them. Sometimes I feel when I look back that they're like a mountain range in the distance, but they're still there. Oh, they're in the distance. They're still there. We should look the other direction. We should look ahead to the brightness and the blue sky. We should look ahead to the sunshine. We should look ahead to the shore, the shore to which we are heading. And there are no mountain ranges before us labeled with our sin and our mistakes and our failures. No, no, no. They are all gone. We go forward. All gone because Christ bore the weight of them at Calvary. What a savior. Oh, God is our judge, but hallelujah. It's a wonderful judge. A judge that dispenses mercy and reward. First Corinthians chapter four and verse three. Paul, oh, this is brilliant. I love these verses. Paul says, but with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of any man's judgment. Don't you hear the apostle saying it? It's a really small thing that I've been judged by you or anybody else. I don't even judge myself, he says. Yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, even, even if I can't see anything in my life. That's not what justifies me, says Paul. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. And when Paul stands before the judgment seat of Christ, it's well done, thou good and faithful servant. Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians five and verse nine.
wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. That is reference to how you have lived your Christian life, how you've served your Christian life, whether it's been a, a good service or a, a weak service. But when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, what is coming your way is ultimate victory. And only Christians stand before that throne, the judgment seat of Christ. But there's a wee phrase that Paul uses in Second Corinthians, eh, First Corinthians four five, at the very end of it. He says, he says, therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man, that's the, those who are standing before the judgment seat of Christ, Christians, he says, then shall every man have praise of God. Wow, this is the judgment seat of Christ. Judgment should be fearful. No, you see, Paul's telling us that when we are judged by our Father in heaven, when we are judged by Almighty God, the end result of that is praise from God. Because all our failings have been dealt with at Calvary. Oh, what a precious sacrifice was the sacrifice of Jesus. And so... Your judgment and mine that Peter is speaking about is not about condemnation. It's about commendation. And so Peter says, with that in mind, understanding that God is such a judge, you should live your life, he says in verse 17, in reverence. Well, would you want to do anything else in First Peter chapter 1, verse 17? If ye call on the Father who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in reverence. Oh, absolutely. That's the way we should live our lives. This is how God is going to judge us. Not like he judges the, the unbeliever. And so while the world is absolutely blind and has no concept of the, of the approaching judgment that's, that's coming to them, while they have got no idea, no concern, no understanding of that judgment that's coming, and they actually scoff at it, don't they? You talk to the world about judgment to come, and they laugh at you. And they'll laugh at the judgment to come, and they'll laugh at the judge, the idea that there's a divine judge. How ridiculous. How ridiculous. They couldn't care less. They treat judgment and the judge with irreverent disdain but when we understand God is our judge and he judges in the way that I've described my goodness me we should stand apart from that and we should live our lives in reverence before this God regardless of what others say but God is not only 
described by Peter as the judge in these verses is also not simply the judge by Jesus Christ. He's also the redeemer through Jesus Christ. For as much in verse 18 as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation or conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. They've been redeemed from a vain lifestyle, a vain behavior that the traditions of their fathers produced. Legalistic law keeping, redeemed from that. Adding human traditions to the word of God which is really to declare that the word of God is insufficient. Adding to the word of God. That's a futile way to live, says Peter, and you've been redeemed from that way of life. You've been redeemed from that way of life. You see, adding to the word of God, my goodness, one of the joys of being a believer today is that this word is sufficient. Nothing else is required. Nothing else is to be added to it. Nothing's to be taken from it. It is what it is. If we could live our lives in that simple truth that the Word of God tells us, and therefore the Word of God tells us how we should be, what we should do, and the result that we should expect, if we could just live our lives in the simplicity of that truth, the world would be a different place because the church would be a different place. And we're told, futile way of life. The magisterium of the church, in other words, the teachings of a particular church, do not have authority over the word of God. And that needs to be made clear today to so many people. It's not your tradition that tells me what the word of God means. It's the Holy Spirit ministering the word of God to my heart that tells me what the word of God means. And I can come and seek guidance from like-minded people who, they, who have also been chosen by God from the foundation of the world and filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to put this word under any authority than the authority of God. To do so is futile. And Peter says all of that kind of thing, the futile life and traditions of your fathers, you've been delivered from that. You've been saved from that. You remember the Pharisees in Mark 7 and verse 13 adding to the word of God and, and Jesus condemns them for making the word of God void by the traditions of men. Peter's readers have been redeemed and thank God this morning we are Peter's readers. We have been redeemed from a vain way of living and seeking God's approval. And we've been redeemed, says Peter, from this vain way of living by the most precious treasure of all. Not gold, not silver, but the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has redeemed us through the precious blood of Jesus. We have been brought out of vanity 
into wondrous joy and hope and victory. Now, I'm here today, and I don't know about you, but I've got, I'm in pain at the moment, right? Maybe you're sitting there in pain. Maybe your pain's in your body or it's in your mind. Well, can I just tell you, you've been redeemed from that. And what your body is telling you, what my body is telling me, is not the truth of the matter. The truth of the matter is, I am going home to victory because of the blood of my Savior. And when I stand there before him, no, I will not be judged to condemnation. I will be judged to reward. And my reward will be life eternal, life abundant, life free, life fulfilled in every way. That's what I'm going home to. That's what you're going home to. That's what God has redeemed you for. Oh, hallelujah. What a savior. He does it through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So don't listen to what others say. Don't listen to what your fleshly weakness at this moment is saying. You are a child of God and you've been set free from all of the fears and concerns that hold the world down. That means the world thinks it's making progress when all the time it's sinking further and further down. Oh, your pain may be making you feel flat and finished and without hope, but that's a lie. Peter says that you have been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. The Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. That's wonderfully true. But aren't you glad that it's not just a general thing? Aren't you glad that the Lamb of God takes away your sin? Aren't you glad that the blood that was shed was shed for you? Aren't you glad that the victory we can sing and rejoice over together and generally in Christ is a victory that has been achieved for you as an individual? Oh, hallelujah. What a savior is our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter says, oh, you have been redeemed by the, the precious blood of the lamb. Surely if we had been redeemed by gold and silver, we would be overjoyed. Surely, if a price could be paid, a monetary price could be paid to redeem our souls, we would be overjoyed at that. Shouldn't we be even more so when we realize that the price that was paid is the most precious thing of all? The most precious thing not only to us, but the most precious thing to God, the blood of his dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ. How precious is that price? And so Peter says, knowing all of this, you walk in reverence. Absolutely. Redeemed from our sin. Sin against the holy God who is our judge. And again, the world that we live in, the world that we live in ridicules not only the idea of eternal judgment, but ridicules the concept of sin. Haven't you heard it regularly in recent months? Haven't you heard When people have been discussing homosexuality, the question coming, do you believe that it's a sin? 
And this poor politician of whatever color it may be is squirming. They know. The world ridicules it. The world ridicules what God holds dear. Purity. Ridicules the idea of the need of a saviour or a redeemer. Well, they would. They don't recognise sin, so why do they recognise the need of a redeemer? It's ridiculous. We know it's true. We know he's our redeemer. We know that the world is heading in the wrong direction, that we live in a Romans 1 society, as my brother Paul prayed on Friday night. We live in a Romans 1 society where the world is being destroyed by sin and they don't care. And those who are in authority are facilitating it. Because they don't believe in sin, therefore it's okay. They only believe in happiness. Well, it makes them happy, you know. Well, if it makes them happy, it's not about making us happy. It's about making us holy before a holy God. The world doesn't recognize it, but we do. And if we do, how should we live? We should live differently from the world. We should not be like the world. We should be making it clear in the way that we live and in the way that we respond that our God is our glorious Redeemer. And we should live not in irreverence towards him, but we should live reverently before God, taking every opportunity to display in our lives the greatness of our God, the wonder of our God, the holiness of our God, the love and the grace and the mercy of our God. We should take every opportunity. We are called to be reverent in a world of irreverence. We are called to reverence in a world that is irreverent. And that's hard to say. How else should we live? How else should we be? This is God our judge through Jesus Christ. This is God our redeemer through Jesus Christ. And Peter finishes this little section. By saying, this great Redeemer was foreordained before the foundation of the world, verse 20, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Peter is saying there that not only is God the judge, our judge, not only is God our redeemer, but he is the source of our salvation. He's already said that in the letter, that it's all of God. He's confirming it. He's repeating it here, that the redemption of his readers was not a divine afterthought, but it was a divine intention, an eternal intention. So I'm just going to quickly touch some scriptures because we've looked at this in the weeks gone past. But let's look at some scriptures just for a, a moment. Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. You see, God had planned it all in advance, in eternity, the, in the mists of eternity. And then Peter tells us he has brought it to light in the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter says, before we go to any other scripture, he says, verse 21, 
verse 20, that it was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Manifest in Jesus Christ. Planned and now shown to you. This plan of God has now been revealed to you. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 9 says the same kind of thing. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. It was planned in Christ, now it has been revealed to you. Now God has let you see it. And he's let you see that the salvation you enjoy is sourced in him alone. And in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, we're told that the Lamb's book of life, in which we have our names recorded, that's why when uh, the, white, the great white throne comes, we will be ushered away from the judgment because our, la our names are in the Lamb's book of life. When was the Lamb's book of life written? According to Revelation 13, 8, it was written before the foundation of the world. My name and your name was written down in glory before the foundation of the world, and it has now been revealed to us in Jesus Christ. God is our Redeemer. Hallelujah. God is the source of our salvation. Therefore, says Peter to his readers, your hope rests on God. You'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and hallelujah, your hope rests upon God. Well, how should that make us live? That should make us live in reverence before him. Judge. Redeemer the source of my salvation. Thank the Lord, he is our Father. And so, we should, knowing this truth, we should live reverent lives because we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Who deserves the glory alone? Almighty God. Oh, how we love you, Father. We bow before you today and we, we thank you for the truth of your word and the power of your word. We thank you, Father God, that we are your children and we are no longer slaves to worldly fear. We are no longer slaves to the fear which they should feel before you set free hallelujah in Christ Jesus or oh, receive from us worship and adoration and may our lives be lives filled with the reflection of this great God that when others see us they see the reverence in which we hold you oh we praise your blessed name today no longer slaves to sin. We are called to reverence in an irreverent world because we belong to our God and Father. Blessed be your name. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.